Hello and welcome everyone to tonight's special event, Safeguarding Our Future. My name is Genevieve Stewart and I'm a campaigner with the Climate Council working on our major polluters campaign. I'm joined tonight by my expert colleagues, Amanda, Dinah and Jen. But before I introduce them properly, I'd just like to start by acknowledging that I'm joining you this evening from the traditional lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I pay my respects to the elders past and present. I also extend that respect to the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia, wherever you are joining us from tonight, and I recognise the continuous connections of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples to land, sea and community. I acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded and that this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. First Nations people have cared for Australia's environment for more than 65,000 years, skillfully managing the landscape and protecting country for future generations. From protecting the Great Barrier Reef to traditional fire management and sustainable agricultural practices, this deep knowledge coupled with meaningful progress on land rights and reconciliation is really fundamental to our ability to continue living sustainably on this continent. There can be no climate justice without First Nations justice, and I really encourage you all now to share the lands on which you're joining us from in the chat. Um, now to our wonderful panel. Thank you so much for being here tonight. I'd like to introduce firstly our fearless CEO, Amanda McKenzie. Amanda is one of the best known commentators on the climate crisis in Australia. She was previously the senior communications advisor at the Climate Commission and alongside Professor Tim Flannery, co-founder of the Climate Council back in 2013. She has now led the organisation as CEO for the last nine years. Welcome, Amanda. Mm -hmm. uh, we're also joined tonight by Dinah Arndt, our Head of Strategic Communications at the Climate Council. Dinah is a former journalist and joined the Climate Council in 2015 to set up the Climate Media Centre, which localises and personalises climate change and impacts and solutions for Australians. She now specialises in best practice climate communications and is our resident media and messaging guru. Thank you so much for joining us, Dinah. Thank you for having me, everyone. <laughs> and of course, Dr. Jen Rayner. Jen is the Climate Council's Head of Advocacy and leads our policy and political engagement across all levels of the Australian government. She has worked as a Chief of Staff and a Senior Policy Advisor to leaders across the Australian and ACT parliaments and focuses, focuses on advancing a positive climate action agenda across the full spectrum of government activity. So thank you and welcome, Jen. Great to be here, everyone. Uh, so thank you everyone for joining us tonight. We are, um, we've gathered you all here uh, because we're reaching a really critical point in our campaign for strong reform of the safeguard mechanism. And for anyone that isn't aware, the safeguard mechanism was set up under the former Liberal government and regulates harmful carbon pollution from around 215 of Australia's biggest uh, polluters. Um, it's supposed to limit how much they're allowed to pollute each year, um, but it's been weak and riddled with loopholes from the very start. The safeguard mechanism captures some of our essential national industries like cement and steel manufacturers, but it also covers the really big giants of the fossil fuel industry like Chevron, Woodside and Santos, uh, who are among the 12 major uh, fossil fuel polluters under the spotlight in our Dirty Dozen campaign. Uh, right now, the federal government is proposing changes to the safeguard mechanism uh, that could turn it into a really important tool for rapidly driving down industrial emissions. So this is going to be one of the most important policy fights that we've had in years. Um, and we're going up against Australia's biggest fossil fuel, polluted, fossil fuel polluters who want to see the mechanism remain weak and riddled with easy ways out. Um, when we obviously want to see these companies start to pull their weight and genuinely cut their emissions because that is going to be essential for Australia to tackle harmful climate change. Um, so tonight we'll take you through a little bit of that detail as well as some of the tactics and strategies that we've put in place so far. Amanda is going to kick us off with a bit of an overview of our broader major polluters campaign and strategy. Um, Dinah will then provide some training on how you can bust through the industry spin when talking to your own family and friends about the safeguard mechanism, fossil fuels and why our biggest polluters need to pull their weight on emissions reduction. And finally, Jen will give you a deep dive on the safeguard mechanism, um, what the vibe is like up in Parliament House. We'll also have some time at the end, hopefully, for a brief Q&A session. So thank you to everyone who's already submitted questions. And if you have any other questions arise from the discussion tonight, please feel free to pop them into the chat and we'll try and get to as many as we can. So to start things off, I'm going to go to you, Amanda. Can you take us through a little bit about what the Major Polluters Campaign is all about and what some of, what some of our key goals in this space are? Thanks, Jen. And it's lovely to be here joining you for Wurundjeri Country and um, to connect on such an important piece of policy work that's been going on now for um, many months, but is reaching, really is coming to a head right now. So I thought I'd give you um, sort of step back and talk a bit about the Climate Council's strategy. 
Um, as you know, we've got the most progressive federal parliament on climate change that we have ever had. Um, we, but we can't just rely on the parliament to get things done. So of course, with the climate election, um, almost this time last year, we had um, the ALP, the Greens, the independent Teals as, and others talking about climate change front and centre. And um, the result is this parliament that there is lots of commitments to do more on climate change. But that's only the beginning. I I'd like to say we've kind of emerged out of the swamp of the last um, nine years, 10 years of um, the climate wars. And we've done so much work to get Australia out of there, but now we've got this big mountain to climb, which is enormously difficult to get policies implemented that are really strong and then can be ratcheted up over time. Because of course, the reductions that the government has committed to, which is certainly better than what we had seen from the previous government, 43% uh, reduction by 2030, is nowhere near what we know that the science is demanding. We argue that it needs to be 75% reduction this decade. So we, um, we have a long way to go, both in implementing the commitments of the current government, as well as then making sure that can be ratcheted up and ratcheted up over the decade. So we're seeing the level of reductions required. So just go to this first slide, Jen. Um, so this gives you a little bit of an insight into our thinking right after the election, we started to think, what is it gonna to take to get that 75% reduction over this decade? Because it's not gonna be a smooth linear curve down as that, that line sort of indicates, because this is a, um, it needs to be a politically nuanced strategy. We're working with governments at all levels to push them to do more and more over time. So our insight basically, as you see these arrows, is that there's a period of a government being elected where they can deliver the commitments that they promised, but then there's a period where they're campaigning for re-election. And during that delivery phase, we want to get whatever they've committed to delivered in its strongest form possible. And potentially we can make though that even stronger than what they've committed to, but at least as strong as they've committed to. And then we want that to build positive momentum and political capital for further action down the track. And at the same time, lay the groundwork that when they're in a campaign phase, working out what are their commitments for the following election, they're going stronger and stronger with a more disruptive set of policies. So you can see through the decade, it's not a long period, we've got two major delivery phases. So the delivery phase we're in now, where we need to get a bunch of policy mechanisms set as quickly as possible um, to send a signal across um, the economy as to Australia's intention, um, the government's intention and the parliament's capacity to work together. And then we also need to be starting to get that groundwork for a step change in what those commitments are. Um, that, you know, in the next election, uh, we're asking all of the political players to commit to stronger and stronger climate action. And that's then delivered in the next term of government. We then are in another period of campaigning. So you can see that we're thinking quite far ahead in terms of how we would need to be um, getting these policies ratcheted up over time. But the critical component is that whatever's delivered this term has to be done so in a way that it builds political momentum. Because as we've seen in the last decade where we've had so much political argy-bargy over climate change, when it's been something that's been, been very negative, that set the parliament backwards. So we need to be building that political capital to do more and do more and do more. Just to go to the next slide. So our theory of change then is essentially number one, we are as an organization there to create the preconditions for good decision-making. So that goes to what we describe as our narrative work, the communications that we're putting out there in the world that many of you are helping us with every day through the social media channels that we use. So it's the media, it's the social media, it's our email campaigns, it's a whole range of other things that are creating the operating environment for decision makers. And so we're always trying to make that um, push in a direction that it uh, requires decision makers to do more on climate change. When you're having um, the conditions there for good decisions, you're likely to get politicians saying, well, what do we do? So you also need the advocacy component, which is putting forward the policies that will meet those the government's needs at the time, saying, well, here's a raft of different policies that help you to tackle this problem and get good decisions made, which takes us to point number two. We then want those good decisions that are made to be celebrated to create a virtuous cycle. So 
as I said, it builds political capital, builds political desire to do more and pulls other political players further along as well. And then the fourth point is we want to see replication and scale. And what we mean by that is, say it's a, a decision of a state government, it could be replicated by other state governments, similarly with local governments, that we're seeing um, decisions that are made that might be um, a certain size now, get bigger and bigger over time and its impact. So the safeguard mechanism that we'll talk about tonight, it can be amplified over time. Let's go to the next slide. So our three strategic priorities, it's growing the good, which is, uh, particularly around um, energy, electricity, transport, all of the good things that we want to see more of, EVs, batteries, um, transmission lines that will take renewable energy through the grid, et cetera, fit in that bucket. Stopping the bad is our major polluters program, which I'll talk about in a minute. And then the third one is what we describe as transforming the landscape. So that idea of we need to be creating a great operating environment for decision makers is something that we've always been focused on as the Climate Council over the last 10 years. And something like our extreme weather program sits in that bucket of work because we are there to make sure that we're illustrating the urgency of the climate crisis every day. We've got this drumbeat of political communications that's coming out to say, um, this latest extreme weather event, let's illustrate how it's been driven by climate change. We just had a mental health report come out last week with Beyond Blue looking at how climate change impacts is detrimentally affecting people's mental health, uh, zeroing in on some individuals that have experienced that uh, disasters and the ramifications that it have had on them and their lives. Um, so that's another sort of lens to allow us to tell that, um, that story of how climate change is urgent, needs to be tackled, and fits in our, um, component, our bucket of things that are transforming the landscape to push politicians to do more. So to go specifically to the major polluters program on the next slide, um, there's two things that we're looking at in particular. So we're driving a transition away from existing uses of fossil fuels, and then we're powerfully advocating against any new coal and gas projects, as I, I'm sure you know, um, the, the budget, if you like, the amount of emissions that Australia can pollute in the next few years does not allow for any new coal and gas projects and we don't need any more to, um, to come into the mix. We certainly are moving away from coal really rapidly. There's a discussion around gas, but there will be a limited role for gas in the transition, which is all existing facilities and we don't need any more gas. We, as you probably know, export um, over 70% of it. So we've got plenty of gas in Australia. The third component we could look at, but we are not focused on, is what is Australia's pollution overseas? So all of the, uh, the coal and gas that we are exporting and being burnt overseas, um, which is a huge, important component. But our view is, unless you've done number one and number two on this slide, the argument for number three is enormously difficult. You have to destroy the social licence of fossil fuels in Australia for Australians before you can argue that we shouldn't um, export the stuff uh, overseas. So that's definitely on the horizon for us and in our minds. And we, we talk about that from time to time, but we think that the number one and number two have to be done prior to that occurring. You can go to the next slide. So our theory of change, that sort of preconditions for good decision making, I've talked about this a little bit, but the community awareness and understanding of the problem is something that in our major polluters program, we've done a lot of. So um, you might have seen some of our work on gas and health, for instance, which was another lens to show how gas burning in homes was impacting particularly children's health. There's a much higher risk of asthma for children that live in homes where there's gas burning. And people aren't very aware that having a gas stove is releasing pollutants into their home environment. So that was a really important report, for instance, to underpin uh, driving a changed community understanding of the impact of fossil fuels. There's a whole range of other work that we do there as well, just connecting fossil fuel burning with climate change. It's often a difficult set of dots to join for people. So it requires a lot of communications work from saying climate change, um, it, you know, the, the impacts are the extreme weather events that you see at sea level rise, et cetera that's due to the burning of fossil fuels can be a leap for people. So there's a lot of explanation work that's required in that space. Um, the other point on this slide is that appetite and support for governments to implement strong solutions. So we are, um, our work is really advocating and 
but as I said before, we we are there to really damage the social license of fossil fuels and their capacity to um, to operate in Australia. They've been operating for many years in um, you know without any consequences, despite the analogy analogies you could make to um, tobacco industry or asbestos and other things. We need to make those same sort of associations for people with fossil fuels. And that will then drive that appetite and support for governments to implement strong solutions. And as I said, we believe we then need to have the solutions ready to go. So that's a lot of what our major polluters work is doing, is also crafting those solutions. So the next slide. And so what are our activities in this space? Um, we did a big pivot last year to say, okay, well, we haven't been doing direct federal advocacy work because um, the previous federal government was not um, not for changing. So we worked a lot, really hard at the state government level. We worked at the local government level. But after the election, we pivoted straight away to say we need a federal advocacy program. And that's the one that Jen is leading. And we've reorientated the organisation around those goals that I've described, the growing the good, stopping the bad and um, transforming the landscape. We had those goals already, but we've transformed the way that we're operating around those to have these federal advocacy components within it. And so the Beta Polluters has had a lot of great creative um, activities over the last um, little while. And at the end of last year, you might have seen this campaign, The Dirty Dozen. We wanted to put the bad guys front and centre. So who are these fossil fuel companies? They're often multinational companies making huge profits, often paying very little tax. So, um, and also the amount of employment in Australia is usually vastly overestimated. So we wanted to put them front and centre in the debate. They're often, um, you know, hiding in the shadowy depths behind um, lobbyists and, um, and, you know, the Minerals Council and other groups. So we wanted to bring them into the debate very publicly. So this website um, had these rotten eggs that you can break. They make a lovely sound on the website as you do that. And it was accompanied by a report that was very um, well recognised in the parliament, um, got great media coverage and a whole range of different content that was shared not only by us, but um, many of you, and then a whole range of different organisations, particularly at the grassroots level, giving a whole lot of content for them to be able to mobilise um, a range of grassroots activists around the safeguard mechanism. The safeguard mechanism we, we've described as being the most important, most boring sounding policy. And this was a way to give it, um, give it life give it a sense of what is this actually about? This is about reducing pollution and stopping the bad guys getting away with doing the bad things. Um, so just to go to the next slide. Um, our work, as I've mentioned, there's a lot of work in shaping new narratives and around coal and gas, it's clarifying for people that any new coal, oil, gas expansion is incompatible with necessary climate action. The gas lobby in particular is pushing really hard still to say that Gas is a critical transition fuel. There is no evidence that supports that. Um, AEMO, who is uh, the market operator for our energy system, has said that you don't need more gas in the transition. There's um, many, many credible sources now that make that very clear, but the gas industry is still pushing that very hard and it's, um, has great access across the parliament. So that's, that's a big fight that continues. So that narrative that gas is dirty, it's unsafe, it has no place in our homes or around our kids, that we need to transition our homes away from gas is an important narrative to, um, to change people's attitude that gas is just benign. It's something that's in all our houses, we all use it, it's necessary, there's no other alternatives. So there's a big piece there in illustrating what the alternatives are. There's alternatives for us personally in our homes, but also um, alternatives for what our grid relies on. In particular, we've talked a lot about batteries and how when um, often the argument for gas is you need something that can come on really quickly, well, batteries can do that faster than gas. Batteries are much more fit for purpose in a modern grid than these old clunky gas fire generators. So as I said, there's a small role for gas in the transition, but it's from existing plants. They will need to be phased out rapidly as well. Um, so there's the piece around gas corporations, profiteering and polluting. Um, so I think that's where it's important to tell the story of gas um, corporations and how little um, relative jobs they offer in Australia. The, um, the little amount of tax that they pay and the um, poor contribution they make to Australia. Um, and so gas driving up the cost of living has been a big issue, independent of the climate issue, but something we've talked about a lot. So all of that goes to obliterating the social license of fossil fuels. 
to the next side. And then driving policy change, as I said, we've got to have that package of stuff to say, well, this is what you need to do, government, if you're going to deal with the problem. So the safeguard mechanism advocacy has been squarely on that. The Dirty Dozen campaign was really raising awareness with parliamentarians of the issues and the importance of this mechanism. And um, we've just released this week modelling by Reputex, which is the same group that the government has relied on around modelling to further illustrate that you can't have any new coal and gas within the mechanism. We've got an industrial decarbonisation report. So that shows what all of these other industries like steel, cement, concrete, et cetera, how they can transition, because of course we will need those industries in um, a modern clean economy, but it's about transitioning the way that they use energy. So there's a lot of possibilities. It's already been done in many places around the world. So um, illustrating that, path, that pathway is important. And there's a lot of inside track work. Jen in particular has had many, many, many meetings with politicians and um, many of the prominent ones that you see um, debating this, we are meeting with very, very regularly. Um, I've talked about getting households off gas. The other interesting piece that we're working on is around fossil fuel sponsorship. You might notice that fossil fuels are sponsoring um, particularly sporting clubs. And it's a, that goes right through from the elite to the grassroots sporting clubs. Um, and so it's a really important one where we can create some guidelines around sporting clubs as athletes are starting to challenge that so that there's a place for them to go to say, actually, this is a better standard. This is how our organization should be engaging with these, um, these toxic products. And then there's the strengthening of the EPBC Act. So that's the core environmental protection legislation in the parliament. And it has a range of different triggers for when big projects um, are approved or, or not approved. And climate is not one of them. So you might've seen that Clive Palmer's mine in Queensland was rejected recently. It was rejected because it would um, likely have an impact on the Great Barrier Reef. What was not considered was the emissions that would come from that project because there is no climate trigger. So we and others have been advocating for some time that it should include a climate trigger. And there's other federal laws that can then come into place to um, obstruct more fossil fuel projects. Just the next slide. And so why is a safeguard mechanism? I've alluded to this already, but the safeguard mechanism is about regulating the biggest polluters, the biggest industrial emission uh, emitters who together are responsible for about a third of Australia's pollution. And as Jen said right up top, um, it was designed by the previous federal government. If you were starting from scratch and saying, what's the best possible policy, you probably wouldn't jump on this one. But it's one that we have and in an environment where, you know, no one's going to be successful in arguing for a, a carbon price across the economy or something like that. So this is what we've got and how do we design it so it can genuinely reduce emissions, it can be ratcheted up over time. And it can um, be an important component in moving us towards that trajectory of getting emissions down. So we think that a range of different um, components of the scheme that we've been putting in our submissions that Jen will talk to in a little bit um, can make it very effective in particularly signaling to those industries that they have to change. Um, and, you know, it, as you might've seen sometimes in the press, a lot of the, even the, the steel industry and others they have, despite having 30 years of information that this is coming, they're not proactively changing themselves. They need to be pushed by government to do it. Um, so hopefully the parliament comes to an agreement on this. That, as I said, sends a really important signal to the Australian economy. You know, this parliament will act and will act progressively through the term. The risk, if it doesn't pass, is that the opposite message is sent. And the polluters just keep doing the same thing, thinking, yes, we're getting away with this. They'll have to regroup and that probably won't affect us to the next term of parliament. So we think it's absolutely critical, which is why we put so much energy into it. Um, but the current plan that the government's put forward needs to be ratcheted up from where it is. And so that's what we've been advocating strongly directly to them and in the, in the media and to other political players. So I think that's my turn to pass over to Dinah now, Jen, unless you want to, um, me to tackle a question first. Yeah, so just had a quick question and just mindful of time, so we'll try and squeeze it in. But you mentioned obliterating the social licence of fossil fuels, and I know so many people here on the call tonight will be itching to get stuck into these polluters and, and help us put an end to new coal and gas. So how important is the role that this community plays in achieving our strategy? Hmm. 
Yeah, it's a really good question. And I'd say absolutely critical. Um, you often hear phrases like, oh, it's all talk, no action. But action comes from talk. We need to be changing the national conversation on this every single day. It needs to be kitchen table conversations about, hey, why do we have gas in our household? Why isn't the government helping us get this toxic stuff out of our house? Um, in schools, why are school heaters still using um, gas? We need to get our school mobilised to get this stuff out of here. All of that is enormously helpful and it's building a community sentiment that this stuff needs to go. This is the new asbestos. So I think it's really critical. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, Diana, I know you do have to jump off a little early tonight, so we're gonna to go to you now. Um, so for people on the call who wanna support our strategy and wanna be having those conversations around the dinner table and in their organizations, how should they approach these conversations? And can you take us through a little bit about what your research um, is saying and how, uh, yeah, and some tips on how people can approach this? Like, how do we cut through the spin? Thank you so much, Jen, and thank you, Amanda, for, for your presentation. So um, if we go to the next slide, I'll just um, run you through what the communications challenges are here, um, what the Climate Council's approach is, um, when it comes to the safeguard mechanism and, and communications, as well as zooming out to the bigger picture and, and a little bit of context around some of the latest research that we've done um, with some particular audiences as well. Next slide, please. So there's quite a few communications challenges when it comes to the safeguard mechanism. The first one, the big one, is uh, no one's heard of it. No one knows what it is. Um, and the second one is even when you explain it to people, um, it's very hard to see for, you know, an everyday person how it connects to their life um, and why they should care about it. As Amanda alluded to earlier, there's a lot of steps in this um, linking the safeguard mechanism and the policy debate that's happening right now um, with the problem of climate change. And it's not obvious to most people how the two are necessarily connected. Um, it's complex and I like to describe it as numbery. Um, and we don't remember numbers and facts. We share stories and remember stories. And so it's really important to consider what the stories are that we're telling here. Um, last of all, um, I think is another important consideration that some bad faith actors could be conflating the emissions that come from critical sectors like the steel industry and the concrete industry and those types of things with actual um, fossil fuel um, the fossil fuel industry. And there's always that argument around um, uh, limiting fossil fuel um, emissions somehow limits our economic prosperity and our well-being as people. Next slide, please. So where is the story at when it comes to safeguard mechanism? It's very squarely focused on the political fight. And I'm sure that's probably what most people have been exposed to so far when it comes to the safeguard mechanism. Um, it's probably no surprise because the media loves a conflict. It's a really straightforward story to tell to say this party says this, this party says that, oh, that's the end of the story. Um, so we'd like to really sort of shift the story um, on um, and if we can go to the next slide. So our approach really is to focus on not the policy per se, but what it actually means and what is at stake uh, in the situation. We really want to highlight how this change or how this policy um, connects to what key audiences really care about. And I'll talk about who those key audiences might be shortly. Um, we do want to separate out fossil fuel corporations from the rest of Australia's economy and industry. Um, and I think it's really important to um, our argument to really kind of um, have most people on our side and um, to tailor our messages to those key audiences. Next slide. So what do I mean by putting our key audiences first? There's, there's three sort of audiences we've been really thinking about. The first one is ourselves and um, everyone on this call is deeply concerned about climate change. Um, they really want to see climate action at the scale and pace that the science says is necessary. Um, when it comes to the federal government, it's really focused on meeting its election commitments. It um, is highly concerned about public support. It's also thinking about its legacy and how it will be remembered 
as well as a bunch of other priority area, areas that it wants to focus on. And there's never ever one priority for a government. So there's many competing priorities. And then the last um, audience we were thinking about is particularly those in Queensland and WA um, where the fossil fuel industry is particularly prominent and influential. Um, often um, people that don't fall into the first category, the, the people that are already highly concerned about climate, their, their highest priority is their family, their community, perhaps a whole bunch of issues um, that they've got to weigh up against each other. Um, and economic prosperity is one of those. Next slide. So what can we, um, as people who care about climate change, be highlighting to people we know? I think it's really important to point out that this is a chance to get a really significant climate outcome in Australia. And I think that that is sort of going over the head of the political debate that's happening at the moment. I think it's so important to point out that if the major polluters aren't reducing their emissions, we can't reach our climate goals. It's just not possible. Um, and allowing new coal, oil and gas projects means we're adding more fuel to the fire and we're already in a very serious situation when it comes to the climate crisis. Uh, next slide. So in terms of the bigger picture, I just um, want to very briefly touch on some research we did recently, and that was testing um, a whole bunch of what we would describe as oppositional messages um, with an audience that is certainly not um, highly supportive of our issue or our cause. And we wanted to see how those messages were resonating with that audience um, and also to find out if there were things we could be talking about that would actually counter those oppositional messages. So I'm going to touch on the status quo versus change, um, what people's number one concern is, um, winning arguments and also achieving change. Next slide, please. So change versus the status quo, I just think um, it's really important to remember that when you're trying to create change, you've already got a harder job than the people that are trying to make things stay the same. Um, and what this research showed was that the arguments that are being made um, against the change that we're arguing for aren't actually persuading people against climate action, but they're very distracting and they are creating lots of confusion. Um, and they're also meaning that people potentially aren't paying attention to the story that we want to be telling. Um, it's really heartening to actually know that even people that aren't highly concerned about climate accept that Australia needs to act and we need to change the way we use our energy first and foremost. But their understanding of what this might mean to them and their lives is very low. And they do have some genuine concerns around what that might mean. So probably no su big surprise here, but the number one concern is costs. And that can um, come across in a number of different ways, which I'll get to. And then the secondary cost a concern was around disruption and uncertainty. Um, and this is all amplified by the fact that this group of Australians have a really low level of trust in traditional power structures. And that's things like governments and companies and organisations. So the, the very people that we would expect to make the change, people don't necessarily trust that they can. And that's probably no surprise considering the last 10 years and what we've seen around climate inaction in this country at a federal level. Uh, next slide. So what concerns are there around cost? Well, people are, uh, have an assumption that um, this will mean higher electricity prices. It has been the lived experience that electricity prices have gone up and gone up a lot. Um, the second is that when government invests in these kind of initiatives, that there'll be somehow a cost passed on to them as a taxpayer. There's also um, often concerns around lack of affordability and accessibility. Um, so how much things might cost and who can actually get access to climate solutions. And then there are some people that are worried about that wider threat to the economy. So how might... Um, Moving away from fossil fuels, um, what might that mean for the economy at large, um, workers and that kind of thing? Next slide. So we also um, tested a bunch of other areas where um, we commonly see arguments made, um, well, okay, renewables sounds nice, but what about nuclear? Or, um, you know, people are worried about coal closures. 
or um, people say, yeah, Australia could do something, but we're only a really small country and what about China? So many of these what about arguments, um, you can actually win the argument um, really effectively. When it comes to nuclear, if you focus on cost first and foremost, um, but obviously refer to the toxic toxicity of nuclear, um, you can very easily win that argument. When it comes to coal closures, when you point to the inevitability that the fact that this change is already underway, again, you can win this argument. And then third, um, people don't hear a lot about China being the largest producer of solar and wind power in the world. When you talk about the amount that China is investing in renewable energy, um, that actually is a really effective argument um, in relation to the world is really shifting on this. All countries are really getting behind it. Next slide. But even if you win all those arguments, you're not actually addressing people's underlying concerns. So just going back to the audience um, that we tested this with, and they're very much people that I would say can swing between um, major parties and are also um, have a level of concern about climate, but it certainly isn't their number one concern. They need the cost concern addressed. And you can do that by talking about how renewables are becoming cheaper and how the change will lead to permanently lower prices. The second part around uncertainty and disruption, you can address that underlying concern by talking about how the way we use electricity has actually already changed. And that makes sense to a lot of people. They understand with smartphones and computers and all these things um, that it makes sense that the network now might be out of date and need upgrading anyway. And then thirdly, you can talk about how Australia actually has an opportunity here. Um, and we can also be quite secure in terms of our own energy, energy independence as well. And that really addresses that lack of trust that people have. Next slide. So in a nutshell, define who your audience is and remember what matters to them. Focus on what they need to know or things that they're interested to hear about. Um, don't conflate the fossil fuel industry with the rest of industry, business, or Australia's economic prosperity. Remember that change requires change, and that can be hard and it can be concerning for some people. They're not yet convinced, are most concerned about cost, followed by uncertainty and disruption. And they also have a lack of trust in the places where we would say this change is going to be driven from. Winning an argument is always very satisfying but I think achieving good outcomes is even better. Thank you. Thanks, Diana. There were some really useful tips and insights that, that I think we should all be um, keeping in mind when we're talking about the need for change, whether that's, you know, people in our community talking to their friends and family or the way that we communicate with the broader public and politicians and decision makers um, and the like. So, Jen, I'm going to go to you now. Um, we've just heard all about the broader major polluter strategy and how the community can get involved. But now let's get really get into the tactics that are in play. So right now the federal parliament is sitting and the government is proposing changes to the safeguard mechanism. Can you take us through what these changes are and some of the work that you've been doing to make sure this reform of the safeguard mechanism is, is as strong as possible? Thanks, Jen, and thank you, everyone, for the opportunity to have a chat tonight. Um, I know that uh, Amanda and Dinah's presentations were prefaced on the idea the safeguard mechanism is boring. I actually think it's super, super interesting, partly because it's so important and also because it really illustrates um, and is a great example of how Climate Council can work differently to have an impact in this new political environment that we are working in. Um, as they've both alluded to, we've been doing a lot of direct federal advocacy on this issue, and it's an example of how we will continue to work in the future under a government where there is more capacity to directly engage than we were uh, fortunate to have under the previous government. Um, and so what we've tried to do with the safeguard mechanism from the start is be really, really clear about what it needs to deliver, because there's a lot of technical detail that you can get buried in. But at the end of the day, there are three things that will determine whether or not this succeeds or fails and whether or not this uh, constitutes strong climate action. And so the first is that emissions have to genuinely go down this decade. I know that seems like a weird thing to say, but one of the features of the scheme as it's currently designed 
is that major polluters in coal and gas and then some of the other industries like steel and cement as well would be able to use unlimited carbon offsets um, rather than genuinely driving down their emissions. We have a real concern about that because if companies can just keep buying offsets on paper and not actually drive down their emissions, then emissions overall in Australia will not go down. And that's what we really have to see this decade if we're going to tackle harmful climate change. So we've been working hard and making the case publicly that emissions have to go down this decade, and that means the safeguard mechanism design needs to prioritise that genuine emissions reduction, not the net emissions reduction of offsets um, relied on for companies that are just going to keep polluting as usual. The second piece, and, and this is part of that broader work that Amanda talked about in terms of uh, reducing the social licence for coal and gas with a view to eventually stopping new projects, um, the safeguard mechanism is not a policy that's set up specifically to assess or block projects, but the settings in it can certainly make it a lot harder and more expensive for these projects to go ahead, and that's what we want to see it do. We want to see it put more barriers in front of new coal and gas projects because we we know that unless those uh, big emitters are pulling their weight, as Dinah said, that means everybody else is going to have to do more. And the third piece there is the fact that the safeguard mechanism actually covers a pretty weird grab bag of industries. And the reason for that is the key criteria for being in the mechanism is that you have emissions of 100,000 tonnes a year or more. So it covers coal and gas, but it also covers cement and steel and aluminium. And in the future, it may well cover critical minerals facilities like lithium mines um, and other green facilities. So green steel, for example, facilities may end up being covered while they're making that transition, although if they can get to a point where they are fully uh, zero emission, then they won't be covered anymore. But what that means is the settings at the moment, if they're applied equally, will be very hard for existing participants in future focused industries or new facilities from those sunrise industries that we'll need more of in the future, like lithium, for example, um, it could make it harder for them to go ahead. So what we have said is that really we should be making life hardest for those industries that time is running out on, like coal and gas. And that would mean that we can give a bit more support and enable some of those other sunrise industries uh, to thrive and survive as we go forward. And so these are the key principles that we have said strong reform would look like. And these are the things that we've been hard at work arguing for in the federal parliament. There's a range of different ways that we've been going about that. And I just wanted to call this out because it points to the ways that Climate Council is changing and evolving our work as we continue to grow and as um, the political environment changes. There's three different ways that we try and advocate for good solutions on this and on the broader major polluters um, campaign. And so the first one there is public facing, building that drumbeat for action. That's where we create the problem and we build the appetite for solutions. And that's the type of work that um, all of you are probably most familiar with Climate Council doing. That's our narrative work, our engagement with all of you is our community, particularly our research reports. Um, and it's all about helping the community, helping Australians and helping decision makers understand that something is a problem and we need to do something about it. Then we move to that next piece, which is about issue specific advocacy. So that's really where we say that here's the solution and here's why it's the best solution that there is. And so in that instance, we will be doing some of those same things. So we'll be doing research and communications, activating the community and others, um, but also more specific analysis on, well, why is this the best solution and how would it work in practice? And what could that look like and where else might it have been done before and where is it working and why is this a good result? And really advocating for a specific outcome, not just saying that we, you know, something is a problem. And then the final piece, uh, which is what I'm working on very much at the moment and it's keeping me rather busy, uh, is the direct advocacy with decision makers. And so that's where we really work closely with the people who are going to make these decisions, um, the, the Labor government and the broader parliament around them, to work through the nuts and bolts. So if there's a particular way that we think something could be fixed, how would you legislate that? What would it look like in regulation? How does it, how would they explain it to the community? You know, drawing on what we know about narrative and how to be really persuasive in your communications and helping get people over the line by helping them solve problems that they have. 
And we're, we feel really fortunate in the parliament that we have now to have lots of great stakeholders who are really keen for Climate Council's input on that. So we've got fantastic uh, climate-focused crossbenchers. Um, we've got the Greens in the upper house who hold a really strong position for negotiating as the key votes. Um, and they're uh, really interested in what we have to say and, and what we want to do. And also the government has a much more open approach to consultation and engagement than their counterparts. Not really hard. Um, and they are also really engaged in this conversation about how their policy agenda can be delivered, but also from our perspective, how we can strengthen that agenda as it's being delivered. So to put that into kind of specific things that we've been doing recently, I won't go through this in too much detail because Amanda has already pointed out to it, but I think that just shows that the way that we need to do all three pieces of that pie. So we need to create the appetite for action through the, the big flashy attention grabbing things like the safeguard mechanism work on Dirty Dozen. Then we need to be clear and compelling on what the, the solutions might be through things like our um, Reputex modelling and uh, industrial decarbonation report, which is coming out later this week. Um, and just to pick up on the Reputex modelling, I don't know if any of you will have a chance to watch 7.30 tonight, but we do understand from some conversations we've had today that Minister Bowen is going to be pressed pretty hard on it by Sarah Ferguson. So uh, if you want something to do after this webinar, uh, going and checking out that episode of 7.30 might be pretty interesting. Um, and then the last piece is that direct advocacy, engaging with the parliamentarians, with the ministers, and really being in the mix of that conversation about how we can strengthen this policy, but also how we can get it done. And so the end goal that we're really trying to get to here has two parts to it. We want the strongest possible settings for the safeguard mechanism, but we want it to pass the parliament. And what that means is that we need to think about both pieces at once. It's not necessarily going to be the case that something which is very hard and very decisive on fossil fuels um, would be the best option in the short term, because it might mean that there is not political support for the government to do all the other things on its agenda, like the energy transformation agenda, like transport, like its reform of the EPBC Act, which will be protecting um, natural places and spaces that we love. So we were thinking about this as a package of work, and we're trying to to make sure that we can deliver this strong reform while maintaining the goodwill and the community support and the momentum to keep doing more and to keep building on things, as Amanda said. And I think at the end of the day, we really want to see this go forward because we think that progress on national climate policy is essential now. We can't keep going one step forward, two steps back in Australia. We have to keep moving as fast as we can while going continuously forward. And a situation where the safeguard mechanism doesn't land seems to us like it will make life harder for getting any of the other great climate action that we need this decade and particularly this term done. And so we're hard at work on this and we'd love you to join us. Um, there are lots of different ways to get involved in the safeguard mechanism work that we're doing, um, whether through the lens of the Dirty Dozen piece or other bits of work that we're doing. Um, and so there's three really, really simple... Whoops, looks like we've dropped out of Jen and she uh, unfortunately was presenting the slides there as well. Um, I can finish up for her. Um, okay. I think the, the core takeaway that Jen was, was getting to at the end is that there's lots of opportunities to be involved with this campaign, that there is the petition that we'll sign, send through in an email after this. It's also about spreading the word on social media, and we've just completed our latest video on this, so we'll be sending that through to you as well. We'd love you to be spreading the word, particularly at this moment where it's so critical in the polit political negotiations. And then also if you're interested in supporting the Climate Council as a donor. This again is a really important um, time to do it. Um, one thing that was coming through in the Q&A is how about agriculture? How about the industries that don't come into the safeguard mechanism? The challenge with advocacy work when we don't have an all of economy carbon price is that every single sector will need a set of policies around it. So our work is just enormous. Um, we've got to advocate in the transport area, in agriculture, in every different sector of the Australian economy to get the sort of climate policies that are really strong and that we need. So um, any support um, would be very much appreciated, whether it's, um, you know, contributing to the campaign or backing us as a donor as well.
Yeah, hundred percent. That kind of goes to the question that I was going to ask you next, Amanda. Um, so Jen will be speaking a little bit about where the negotiations may land, but the safeguard mechanism isn't the only lever that we're pulling to drive down Australia's emissions. So what are some of the other things that the Climate Council will be working on beyond this specific re reform process? And I saw a question in the chat earlier about the timing of it, and it, it's, it is due to be wrapping up. We're reaching a really critical point. So what's next after this? Yeah, absolutely. So the safeguard mechanism is the core of our focus for the next few weeks, but if it passes the parliament, it's likely to do so very soon, and that would then be starting to be implemented in mid-2023. The next big piece of policy reform will be fuel efficiency standards. So that is how we regulate our vehicle fleet. It will help to bring on more electric vehicles. So there's a whole campaign that's been in the works for many months on that as well. So fuel efficiency standards is critical. But then we have to um, continue to work through each of the different sectors of the economy. So um, the fuel efficiency standards, though, Jen, is the next big fight. Absolutely going to be the next big fight. And I think we've learned a lot of great things from our work on the safeguard mechanism about what it's going to take to get great change done in this environment. Um, so we're excited to have more to tell you soon about the work that we're going to be doing on that because we're going to go hopefully roll right off a great outcome on safeguard mechanism into a strong campaign on fuel efficiency standards. Yeah, thanks, Jenna. Just before uh, we dropped, before you dropped out, I was just going to ask you what you thought the vibe was like up at Parliament House. I know you've been meeting with Chris Bowen and Adam Bant and some of the Teal Independents. So, how important is it that the Parliament comes together on the safeguard mechanism? And do you think they're going to get there this time? I think there's an enormous amount of goodwill within the Parliament and a real appreciation for how important this is. I don't talk to anybody who is cavalier about the fact that we are in a climate crisis and that the actions the parliament can take will really determine whether we tackle the challenges that Australians are facing right now and that are going to get worse if we don't act. So I think there's a lot of goodwill. I think there's still a way to go in the conversation about what's going to get everybody there. Um, but I think what's really encouraging is the way and the spirit that parliamentarians are engaging in this conversation and recognising how important actions like the safeguard mechanism are to us really driving down emissions this decade. Yeah, awesome. So we just have five minutes for a really quick Q&A from the community and I have a few that have been sent in and a few more that have come through um, through the chat tonight so we'll try and get to as many as we can but first I just want to touch on the offsets question Jen and I know you spoke a little bit about it but there's a question from Janelle around why we even allow carbon credits and offsets at all and, and would it be better just to ban them altogether? It's a really important question and it goes to the carbon mitigation hierarchy um, because really the best and quickest way for us to make progress on tackling climate change is for big polluters to stop polluting, for them to genuinely cut their emissions, um, for example, by changing the technologies that they're using, by uh, using renewable energy, or in the case of coal and gas, by stopping opening new facilities and phasing out their existing ones. So that's got to be the, the top class, the primary action that we encourage all businesses to take. There are some industries, and the safeguard mechanism covers a number of them, where the technology solutions are still under development and it might be a few years before they are fully able to operate in a very low or zero emissions way. So at the Climate Council, we do recognise that offsets will have some role to play, but we're really focused on making sure that they are used just for the remaining small share of emissions that can't be otherwise avoided or abated. Um, because if we don't genuinely cut emissions, then we won't be able to make progress on tackling climate change at the end of the day. Yes, very true. And I think a follow up question that and I might throw this one to you, Amanda, is does the Labor government need new coal and gas during, uh, during the transition to a fully renewable economy? No. <laughs> short answer. <laughs> short answer. I think we've got a, a number of very credible sources now, including the Australian market energy operator that says, you know, we don't need new coal and gas. There will be some role for gas, but it will be very small with existing facilities. So, um, you know, the pathway is very clear. Any argument in that vein is just false. Okay, we have a question from Mike. Um, so, you know, even though the science and the evidence is clear that we don't need new coal, uh, new coal and gas, the ALP is reluctant to impose a ban or outright, come out right and say that. So what are the alternatives that we can do uh, to make it unviable to open new mines? Hmm. Do you want to take that, Jen? <laughs> 
Yeah, sure. I think one of the reasons that we are really focused on getting a strong safeguard mechanism in place is that this is one of the ways in which we can make life harder for new fossil fuels. If we're requiring businesses to cut their emissions through the safeguard mechanism, requiring them to do that first with abatement on site and and then later by buying credits if there's some share that they can't, um, then that's a big hurdle to put in front of new coal and gas projects because we know that they're very dirty and very polluting. And so this is one example of the policy approach and then there's a range of other levers that Amanda mentioned at the start that we will also be working on, things like strengthening federal environmental law so that uh, emissions actually have to be properly assessed, looking at getting rid of um, fossil fuel subsidies and public financing, because it's absolutely irresponsible that the government would be funneling money to fossil fuel companies during the climate crisis. Um, And there's a much broader range of things that we could do, some of which um, are a little bit out there from the parliament's perspective, but for example, legislating a duty of care for future generations. So um, meaning that the parliament has to take into account the future impact of harmful climate change when it's making decisions today. So there's a lot of different ways to come at this. We're thinking about as many as we can, and we'll be working on many of them in the the months and years to come. Yeah, absolutely. Death by a thousand cuts, I think. Um, I think that's pretty much all we're going to have time for tonight. I really want to thank our panellists, Amanda and Jen, and Adina, who was uh, unfortunately had to jump off a little early, uh, for bringing their insights and their expertise to the discussion tonight. And of course, a really big thank you to everyone on the call who's joined us tonight and made the time to come along and learn a little bit more about our major polluters campaign and our advocacy work around the safeguard mechanism. The Climate Council is 100% independent and powered by this community. Um, And we couldn't put these tactics and strategies into place without your ongoing support. Um, And any impact we make is is impact that we make together. Um, Hopefully hopefully you're all feeling energised and ready to go out and tackle the big fossil fuel polluters and have those conversations with your friends and family. Um, There should be some links posted into the chat now to our resource pack, which includes a bunch of images and uh, social media tiles and videos and a link to the petition if you haven't already signed that. Um, and yeah, there'll also be a post event survey. So if you have two or three minutes just to fill that out, we really, really appreciate your feedback and it'll help us run more events and better events like this in the future. So just again, thank you everyone for being involved tonight, for coming along and stay tuned for updates on where things land with the safeguard mechanism. It's all happening and we'll be sure to keep you informed um, as things progress. So thank you again and have a wonderful rest of your evening. Thanks for coming everyone. Thank you.